trust. All right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. So I gave this presentation at SAM Camp. Uh, that was two weeks ago. Um, uh, Form API or FAPI in the Drupal world uh, really was a, a, a just a light bulb going off for uh, myself. Um, before I get into who I am and my background and why I'm speaking about this, though, uh, I did a shout out for somebody who couldn't attend San Diego camp, and it was just a miserable, miserable showing. So I'm going to try to do it again today. I invite you all to join me. Uh, if you don't know about it already, this is Drupal Fit, GDO slash Fit. Uh, us as programmers or people who work on the computer, we get to be, uh, I don't know, my neck is starting to kill me. I think I've got four slip disks and uh, the chiropractor just doesn't help anymore. So I'd really quickly just like to invite everyone to stand up, stretch a little, and let's, let's, do, let's do 12 jumping jacks. I tried 20 in the last group. No one, no one even stood up last time, so this is already infinitely better. Ready? Here we go. And one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, that's fantastic, everyone. Just give yourself a round of applause. Right, exactly. We are back in gym class. So, uh, if you haven't seen Drupal Fit on GDO yet, uh, that is it. And uh, you can go sign up. It's a great opportunity to just remind yourself about. Um, Staying healthy while programming Drupal sites. Uh, Wait, this has nothing with Fappy? No, this is my introduction. Thanks. This is my introduction before we even get there. Uh, so, all right, uh, back to yeah, back to our presentation. Uh, okay, so I am Stevenator on Drupal.org and Groups.Drupal.org. Um, yeah, you can reach me at me at stevenrifkin.com. All of my slides will be posted afterwards on SlideShare, and uh, I believe that uh, Sandcamp has already posted the video of this uh, if you have not seen that. Uh, in addition to Drupal, I'm a Ruby on Rails guy. That's uh, the community I came from. Um, if you guys are new to Drupal, new to programming, uh, there are all sorts of different ways to <laughs> approach uh, uh, putting together uh, either a CMS or actually an entire framework stack. So. Talk to people, get to know uh, all of the different types of ways you can do things. Um, I'm used to model view controller, and uh, Drupal was a little bit different for me, but it's, it's, it's similar with its templating system and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that stuff possibly through here. Uh, I'm also putting up a new site called Code Stubble, mainly because I always get up and I just have a full beard by the time I get out of that chair. So uh, freelancer, hobbyist, world traveler. Okay, many ways to skin a cat uh, is my first fappy slide. Um, yeah, the forms, forms in general, there, there are a lot of ways to do it. You can build your own forms, you can build uh, your own way in, and I think that when a lot of people approach Drupal, they get themselves into trouble by assuming that, oh, you know what, I don't know the right way, so I, I know how to do this, I'm just going to do this myself, uh, which that does work. It's just that you run into a lot more problems should you want to upgrade. You also run into problems where maybe Drupal could have handled certain things like translation or actually sanitizing the user input data, which is a real big deal with the Form API and uh, definitely a reason why you want to stay involved with the Form API. Um, also with the Form AP API, there are many ways to get it done so that you don't have to use the Form API. Some contributed modules that uh, you can look at are WebForm. Has anybody here used WebForm before? Okay, so a large group of people here. It's, it's pretty much your easiest way into creating forms, a form that is actually a node that you can build different types of inputs on, whether it be uh, an email, whether it be uh, a text area, et cetera, et cetera. It'll do most of that. And WebForm itself uses the Form API to build your form uh, in an abstract way. Uh, the Rules module does a lot of this very well. We'll look at a real simple, uh, couple simple examples of Form Alter. Uh, but rules kind of takes care of that. If you've ever wondered, like, hey, I'd like to send my user to this node or this page after they've uh, registered on my site, how do I do that? Well, rules will handle that for you. You can just say, after user submission, redirect. Well, there's a lot easier ways to do that if you're used to writing the code for it, but I would definitely recommend a real quick look at rules module. Um, uh, the only thing that ever got me about rules module was that if you wanted to use Ubercart, they have their own conditional actions. 
uh, and it would be nice if they had always they had integrated, but there are a few nodes out there on, uh, on uh, Drupal.org that kind of explain the rationale why they didn't do that. But since Ubercard is kind of the 400-pound e-commerce gorilla, uh, it's, it's important to note that, that rules module uh, does not integrate directly with that e-commerce e platform. Uh, C tools, and I put thanks at M. Durrell. Uh, uh, Mike Durrell is, uh, uh, he works at Digitaria in San Diego and did a C Tools presentation at SAM Camp. Uh, coming from the Rails backgrounds, um, the, the framework there has all of the uh, Ajax widgetry built in using prototype. Uh, and the kind of question the community was up against was that or Moo Tools. So um, Drupal has already adopted jQuery. Uh, I love jQuery, I love writing in jQuery, so uh, it's a very simple language and I would say please don't let a new language keep you out of the jQuery game. If you like uh, uh, dabbling and stuff, it's very easy to use if you know uh, the basics to selectors in CSS and how to string together some functions in JavaScript. Uh, okay, so another thing, hook form alter. Yeah, so the rules module will do that, but that function alone will take care of just about most Unless you're building your own form itself, it'll take care of about just about every scenario that you need to use, whether you're using hook form alter or hook menu alter in your module. Uh, anybody have any other modules that uh, they've used before for forms? Form builder. I've not dabbled in that, although I have read the documentation on it and it seems very powerful. Any other modules? Arrange fields. Arrange fields. Uh, I've never used that before. That's pretty sweet. It's like a GUI for arranging your fields. Is it kind of like uh, uh, like your CC content fields where it's actually giving you a build mode for views and things like yes, that, like Display uh, Suite does? CCK or web form or basically anything, you know, even a user form. You can go in and you can just drag and drop your forms, your drop downs and all that stuff. It's, it's amazing. I'll have to check that out. So that was a range fields for those of you that didn't hear him. Um, okay, so we can move in. So the first thing when making your own forms is make a decision. Just make a, a, a decision before you begin. And I've, as I've started to work in Drupal more and more, as with some of my other Ruby on Rails projects, planning is your best friend. So if you understand what your goal is, it's a lot easier to achieve it, obviously, uh, versus it being this amorphous thing where you kind of want all these things to happen. It's so much harder to actually build that kind of logic into um, uh, a form. Uh, so, uh, again, if you do go with a contrib module, make sure you test it. Uh, make sure you get 10 other people to test it as well before you launch that on a live site, because I guarantee you different platforms will uh, represent different things. I believe wasn't, uh, isn't IE still having problems with the forms API in Drupal 7? Does anybody know if that got resolved? It's uh, IE 8. And, and it's uploading files, right? Yeah, so, you know, little things like that can creep up that maybe you weren't aware of, but obviously having a good plan together and testing all of the stuff before you do anything with is a good idea. Uh, and then the next one is really a good one that everybody, I think, kind of skips. Uh, you know, whether it's Drush Enable or whether you actually do go to the modules page and click Enable, uh, it's really, really helpful to have a read of the old .module file. Uh, the README text is also helpful, but the .module file really tells you what's going on in the module and what forms it's building, what settings it comes with. So uh, even though you may be intimidated by the .module file, hopefully listening to a little bit of this tonight will give you uh, a path forward in that file. Um, yes, and then my last one again, of course, can you get away with just hook form alter? Because a lot of things are simple. Uh, maybe you already have an existing structure with Drupal that you just kind of want to tweak a little and you don't really want to deal with the whole thing. So we'll look at a scenario like that tonight. Uh, okay, build a module. That's the first thing that we needed to do for our uh, API demo today. Um, so the module builder module uh, is a fantastic module, and I'm, I don't want to butcher this man's name, but uh, Hakim Noriko. Anyone met this gentleman before? No? Okay, maybe uh, maybe a woman, but uh, looks more masculine to me. So uh, this is a great <laughs> module uh, that will basically dump a module in your modules folder, whether it cites all modules or if you're actually in um, your own project's uh, site folder, you can create a modules custom folder in there. So the nice thing about that is it gives you, I took a little screenshot of the module itself, uh, a code detail level. You can actually 
choose beginner. And I, for the most part, I've done this many times. I still choose beginner because I love having the documentation at the top of the functions that it will spit out into the module for me. So that's wonderful to have. And you can then speci specify which hooks you want the module builder to build into your module. So we'll, we'll do an example of that really quickly. Uh, yes, yes, we're going to do it right now. So uh, the last piece of that also to know is that it comes with Drush hooks. So if you like Drush and you like working on the command line, it's literally just one line with, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word, not hook, but... Uh, parameters. Yeah, the parameters that you pass in. You can just pass in a write parameter and it'll actually write the module for you to your folder. Uh, so uh, a couple things about module builder there. Pulls the hooks that you need. It is for lazy developers to remind you without having to go to api.drupal.org to look up your hook function. Uh, and uh, I never know how to spell noobs, so it's really helpful for newbies. Uh, and then the last thing I just showed you a picture of was toggling the comments. So here's that Drush command I was talking about. Drush MBDL is the first one. That will actually go to api.drupal.org, grab the hooks, and download it into your files directory so it can read from that hooks directory. You can update that directory from time to time as well, depending on what version of module builder that you're using. Uh, I'm sure that this will be ported to Drupal 7. So at the point where that is, it'll download the Drupal 7 hooks and install those into your system. Uh, hey, what's happening? Uh, so um, the next one is my uh, command that I use to build this particular module, Drush MB, the name of my module, Fappy Demo, and then the hooks that I want to include in this module. So I wanted the node, hook node API, hook menu, hook form, and hook form alter. So it returned uh, a, it re basically if you don't put a, a, a switch in it, that was the word I was looking for, switch. Oh, yeah, switch. Yeah, if you don't put a switch in it, it'll actually just spit out the text into your terminal. Or uh, if you don't like using the terminal, if you were to go to your actual module page, the module builder site configuration page, it would spit the text out to you in a, in a for, uh, uh, text area field. And you could copy that text out. You would create your mymodule.module file. And you would also create a mymodule.info file. So let's take a look at those really quickly. Uh, actually, do we, we, should just, we should do some drush just because it's fun. I mean, come on, really? Okay, so we can just do drush uh, module builder. Uh, we'll call this a test for form API. And uh, we'll just do uh, menu alter and form. Those will be our two hooks. Oh, I forgot to write this switch. So the point is, is that if I don't do this, and you can look up online, they have all of the switches that you can do, but I know write is pretty much my favorite, so I don't have to actually copy and paste stuff. But you can also use the add switch. So if you actually have a module in your modules folder that's named test FAPI, it will write those new hooks into an existing module rather than write a new one. Uh, be careful with that switch, though, because if you do have an existing hook in your module, it will overwrite it. It won't even check to see that it exists. It'll just wipe it right out for you. So could be could be advantageous if that's what you're looking for. So let's go ahead and hit the Enter button. Uh, it gives me all sorts of uh, uh, questions here to fill out because it's going to help me fill in my dot, uh, .info file. Uh, no, I wish it did. <laughs> um, this is always a tough one for me, the dependencies. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this one. I, I picked this one up the other day and I, I shouted it out. If you put a space in front of the package name, that will bring your module packages all the way to the top of the module list. You don't have to scroll all the way down to find whatever you named it. So I've, I've never done, I never did that before, and I've used it every single time since I knew it. So always nice, and you know, when, you're, when your client comes to look at your modules page, all your modules are on the top. So you can be like, here are your custom, we developed these custom for you. So, uh, <laughs> so there it is, it spit out all of that into my page. But if I do go over to my directory and take a peek, uh, I gotta look for the sucker. Uh, we're gonna be in the demos, form API, sites, all modules. And uh, there we are. Test Fappy. Yeah. yeah, there it is. There it is. So uh, let's. Yes. I'm like, did I forget my right? And then I like did it twice. Nope. 
So there it is. It named this out for me. I do want to leave that blank, but now I can enable this module, and that was my .info file that it created for me. So that's what shows up in your list of modules, and here are my two uh, hooks. So uh, does everybody know how hooks work in Drupal? Hook and name. Does everybody know how that works? Maybe we should cover that for a second. Uh, so basically the idea here is there's the function. That's the name that Drupal will look for. The word hook is replaced by your module's name. So here my module was test F -A -P -I. So test F -A -P -A -S, test FAPI underscore module alter or menu alter, excuse me. And of course, test underscore form would give me the uh, hook form implementation. Uh, we don't need to save that. Okay. So let me switch. I think I'm like presenting, but I'm not presenting. It's always so weird with code. Like you always want to just go to the code, but then you have slides. And uh, so, okay. So really quickly, just some personal thoughts on the form API. Uh, those of you who are uh, intimidated by programming at all, this is a great place to start. Um, mainly because it has great documentation. Also because it's the ability to actually read and write arrays is huge, not only in the world of PHP, but any other programming language for that matter. So it was a really easy way. I, and I also wished for Drupal that someone had started me here. Because if someone had told me, go learn the form API first, I think I would have learned a lot of other best practices for Drupal right off the bat rather than having to knock around and be like, oh, I'll just build that myself. <clears throat> so you can save yourself some time if you've never dabbled in the form API and do that. Okay, understanding the past. So, yes, uh, the release of Drupal 4.7, this is right off of one of my source pages, which I'll list at the end. It introduced the form API, which was a framework, of course, for processing, uh, excuse me, building, displaying, validating, and submitting user data. Um, you can read the rest of it there. Approach makes it possible for modules to customize other forms, as we saw with the a hook form alter, and allows designers to customize the on-screen di display of the forms, and we'll talk about that with custom theme functions. So uh, after 4.7, that was uh, Form API 1.0, Form API 2.0 came out right with uh, Drupal 5. So uh, the biggest thing about the, the two different versions was basically that Form API 1.0 basically handled the display and the submission of the form with just one function. There were other functions behind it, but it wasn't really a, con a concept to build multi-step forms at that time, or at least it wasn't very easy to do. So with the advent of Form API 2.0, like I said, uh, uh, that was introduced in Drupal 5, we got a few more functions that were dedicated to processing, validating, submitting uh, uh, the form, and then also displaying the form. Uh, so we're going to look at the loop, uh, that loop. I've already mentioned it once, but uh, this is your biggest tool in the bag. Uh, when I went to Sand Camp, for some reason it had escaped me that Apache Solar was running Drupal, uh, the API page. And uh, I actually don't have this pulled up, so why don't we just do that really quickly. Let's see. It's got to be here. No, these are my demo pages. Ah, there it is. Okay, so wow, glad no porn came up in the uh, the favorite pages there. So this is the API reference here. I'm losing my mouse. There we go. Okay, yeah, that recorded, didn't it? Okay, so this is. Uh, <laughs> You're losing your mouse because you watch too much porn. Yeah, maybe maybe that's what it is. Yeah, although I, I wear that. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> So, so here we have, uh, this, this is one of the uh, easiest ways to kind of get around the API and learn. Apache Solar runs this search box. You can just type in anything, really, and it'll start to bring up the most common uh, API functions that you can use, and I really recommend this highly. Make sure you click, say again? Except when it doesn't. Except when it doesn't. Thank, thanks for pointing that out, Kevin. Well, I, I haven't run into the in case it doesn't, so... So I, I, would, I highly recommend coming here and doing this type of stuff. So um, yeah, so that's the form API itself. Back to this guy. Um, and also I'm listing node 751826. That is the API quick start guide for uh, the form API. So great way to get started on forms. OK, so let's talk about how the form API works. And to do that, we should look at it. This is the reference to the form API. Maybe I can like shrink it. 
if that may help. So uh, this is really one of your best uh, use scenarios for uh, building a form when you start. At the top of the, uh, the page or the grid, you can see all of the type of inputs that you can use. So when you build your array and you select the type key, you would use one of these uh, headers as the type. Checkbox, check boxes, date, field set, file, password, password, confirm, radio, radio, select, take, uh, text area, text field, and wait. So they all kind of make uh, sense. And then, of course, the properties on the left side that go along with them would make sense, right? A text area is going to be one that has rows and columns, but a text field does not. So uh, if you have basic HTML knowledge of inputs, uh, this is very simple to use and very, uh, really, really uh, um, paramount when building your own form. I don't think I've ever built a form without this, uh, uh, without this web page open right next to me the whole time. So uh, I really highly recommend looking at that. Oh, and uh, yeah, if you click on any one of these, it'll take you down to an example and its usage on the same page. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to want that one next, I believe. Okay. Okay, so uh, two things to, uh, to talk about in that actual uh, 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 property section of how we would build our form. Uh, we want to talk about the tree uh, key for the array, and there's also a key called markup. Um, tree is interesting because it's a way of telling Drupal how to uh, store and to save the values of the user input. So uh, let's say I build a form, and I've got a field set that wraps the user's name. So we would say the field set is called, or we'll just call it name, and we'd say that the text inputs that we're going to use are, are text fields, and it's first name and last name. Well, in the a way that that would be written in the array, we would have name as our first part of the um, array, and then we would have first name, then we'd have name and last name. When Drupal saves this to the form state values, after a user has submitted that, Drupal will flatten that out. Basically, it will get rid of that prefix key of name and just store the last piece of the key, which would be first name and last name. That can get you if you're sitting there testing your form and submitting and you haven't told the tree to save its structure. So setting the tree parameter to true will keep the form structure that you write. Some people care, some people don't. It all depends if you have very similarly named fields on the page. Maybe you've got a recipient name, a billing name, and a shipping name. Well, at that point, you might want to keep that tree as true. So I have an example coming up with tree. Second example is markup. So uh, markup is basically everything that's not an input. <laughs> if you want to put actual HTML on the page, you can use the markup element to do that and basically spit out HTML uh, before and after places in the form. There are also uh, 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 keys in the actual element, the form element, and when I say element, I mean like a text field or a text or a area or a select dropdown. Uh, in that element, you can always use the keys prefix and suffix as well. Prefix would put HTML before it spits out that input field, and suffix, of course, puts HTML after. So there those are right there. Uh, I found that this, over time, as uh, time has passed, uh, a lot of the JavaScript callbacks can be handled this way because you want to put an ID or you want to put a special class around this particular element. So that, would, that again, is markup would be its own element. And then within an actual uh, input uh, element, you can use prefix and suffix. OK, so before we do that, let's go look at our first basic example. Uh, OK, Fappy demo menu. So uh, hook menu. Uh, I got to do a little bit of module stuff just because you got to understand how the page is calling itself. So uh, you can see here in items, I've named uh, two menu paths. One's Fappy Demo and one's Fappy Demo Success. I've given the page a title. I've told the page to call back this function. And of course, a success function if I do succeed. And so I can come down and look for this. Uh, there was a question last time I presented about this. Why did I actually use a... Uh, an actual function for the page callback, and why wasn't the page callback itself the hook form? Uh, 
Again, there's many ways to do this. Uh, calling hook form itself the first time is certainly, certainly doable and advisable, but I also like doing other things with my functions on the page. So sometimes I like to abstract out the actual form building from how I render a page. So that would be why I'm using this. So you can see why I'm calling now Drupal get form and fappy demo markup value. So I'm, I'm doing an example with the markup element and the value element. Oh, I didn't talk about value, did I? We'll do that in a second. Uh, but Drupal get form is a function, and all that function looks for is a form ID. So the ID is usually the name of your function, unless you expressly give it the pound ID element or key to the array that you're about to build. But form uh, fappy demo markup value is my function, and there it is down there. Uh, and you can see that I'm just passing in the form state as a reference. Uh, that's that ampersand uh, as a reference to my function. Really quickly, I just need to cover a value uh, before we go through that. I thought that this slide was in the opposite order. So value, yes, very important element to the form API. Why? Because sometimes you want to store data or you want to uh, bring in data from another function uh, uh, one of the examples that I used recently was a client wanted to integrate their, um, their users table to HiRise. Uh, if ever, anybody uh, knows 37 Signals, HiRise is their uh, customer relationship manager, and uh, they had everything in there. So it was great to be able to pull information through their uh, function API, bring it into my Drupal site, and store values that I didn't have to put out on the page. So the point is, is that this is an internal form element that I can set up in my form using any values and it will save the values for me as I process the form. So what's key here is that's not editable by a user. A lot of times when you read things on Drupal.org where it says, hey, do this and just hide the fields, well, I guess that's acceptable, except if you get somebody who's crafty and wants to open up, you know, Firebug or whatever and edit your hidden form fields. They're on the page, they're there for the user to play around with. All right. And so people might do things like that. So people might do things like that. They're not your average user. So, of course, if all you're doing is selling, I don't know, scotch tape, those people probably aren't uh, going to be hacking up your forms. But it is possible. So, again, it's about holding sensitive data. And it will be joined once the user submits the form. Your value element will be joined back into the form state array for future use. Um, there's another function that you can also use that I put here at the bottom called form set value. Uh, again, it's pretty simple, straightforward, where you pass in the state of the form, what the key of that value is, and it will add that into your form as well. So that's another way to do that. Uh, okay, so back to the code. So I basically have done a few things. So my form is going to be an array. Uh, the first part of it is a markup example, right? And I've added that as a value to my page. I'm just basically passing it onto the page and saying, this is some pretty good markup. Uh, underneath that, I'm actually creating a text field. So the name of that element is going to be value markup text. And again, it's just anything underscore text that I'm using. The type I got from the reference uh, on Drupal.org, it's going to be a text field. My title says enter something, and I'm going to make sure that somebody is required to enter that field. The next one underneath, we have... Uh, a value example where we're, our, our actual type is a value, you'll see that this one is not printed out on the page because I've defined this type value. And uh, um, uh, you'll see after I submit the form, it'll automatically show up on the next page. How did that get there? That will be what we're looking at. And then, of course, my last piece of my form array will be my submit or what I do show to the user. Lots of ways to customize submit. And if you've actually looked down the Node API and seen the a way that they submit there, there's actually a different element in the array here called buttons. And you can list multiple buttons that have multiple submit functions, depending on what the user clicks. For example, preview or save when we're saving nodes and things like that. Uh, I forgot to say this one up here. I, I skipped past it. Uh, the value of this element is that HTML. When I don't declare a type, when I don't declare a type, Drupal assumes that you're talking about the markup element. So Drupal thinks that I'm about to throw out HTML using that element. So let's go to our page. 
And there we are. So there's that top piece right there. This is some pretty good markup, ain't it? That was that form element right here. So it's just a markup element that gets printed on the page. I'm going to enter something. And my submission said submit to see what happens. So, ooh, there we go. So I entered something. And uh, a little cheeky this morning, aren't we? Uh, my original presentation was in the morning. But uh, this is how that got in there. So you can see that I'm using the same exact name for my validation function. So it's very similar to how Drupal wants you to play. You don't have to do this, though. You can declare a validate key and pass it a, a callback function to define some uh, validate function that you've used all over. Maybe you've developed your own API and you have your own uh, validation functions that you want to run on a certain element or an element type, you can continuously call the same function by passing in a validate key up here. So here I just said uh, we're looking at the form state values. Actually, you know what? Let's look at that really quickly. So I'm using a function from the develop module. Uh, this means Drupal print message. And all of a sudden, I get this nicely formatted array with kimono. Um, it's awesome. <laughs> if you've ever done any module development, I highly recommend having Devel module installed and using the array. Uh, so I'm just looking at what state my function's in. It looks like there's nothing in the storage element, and my form state values has not been set, meaning nothing's happened on this form. So if I do this again, I'm just going to force that error one more time. And it looks like it's still pushing me back with nothing in the array. So this time, we will. Oh, that's right. It's because it's in my post. I'm sorry. So you can see everything that came back through, the build ID. Uh, is everybody uh, comfortable with uh, using tokens in forms? Does anybody need us to cover that? What a token is in a form and why it's secure? Please. Okay. Yeah, OK, OK. So, uh, uh, when you install Drupal for the first time, one of uh, the variables that's set in, is it the systems table or is it the variable table? Can anybody tell me? I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it's the variable table. Okay, so when you install Drupal for the first time, you run the install, it actually creates a custom key for you and stores it in that variable table. Uh, it will base every token that you put out onto the page off of that key so that it can always check against it when a user is submitting back to know that the form was created, was indeed created on this site. So nobody can use any type of malicious behavior like cross-site scripting, et cetera, to hack up your site or basically bring it down to its knees. So anyways, I submitted something else that time. That means that my validation function passed. So that was my validation function right there. It passed, which means it then goes to the submit function. So again, the, the name of my form ID underscore submit. And it's looking to see, has all the validations passed? If it has passed, passes it to the submit function. Let's see really quickly how that happens. And this is in the Drupal process form. Uh, I, I felt like this was just a much cleaner way of looking at how Drupal runs its processing on the form array. So rather than me say it, we can just look down. It runs the form builder, meaning it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, bring that form uh, array back together with all of your elements. It then runs validate form, checking for any custom validate functions or any validate functions that it's looking for, meaning form ID underscore validate. After that, it, seems if, it sees if it is um, uh, caching, of course, with forms is a whole other issue. We won't go into that. But after that, it, it, sees, it sees if you passed validations, and if you did, it would then go to the submit functions. Where are they? Is it under execute? Yeah. Yeah. So this will take you through your submit functions. And if you pass submit, it will then redirect your form to wherever you've told your form to redirect to. There's ways to not redirect the form and have it display an empty form after a user has posted and successfully submitted you would not uh, select redirect. You would just have rebuild, uh, the rebuild element set to true. OK, back to here. 
I think I skipped this one. So a uh, quick detour for hook theme. Uh, in your module, you can register theme functions in your module uh, as well as in your own theme. But uh, in, in the uh, form API reference, you will notice that there is an actual theme element uh, or hash mark theme that you can pass custom theme callbacks not only to the form itself, but to each individual element. If you want a text field to be displayed this way, you can pass a custom form for just that text field versus the next text field can be a completely different one. Uh, so it, uh, Drupal really allows you to uh, have custom uh, theming. Again, this is very useful with Ajax. And uh, I just mentioned the, the last one there that there is a theme key for each one of those. Um, Okay, so other keys worth mentioning. Uh, the after build, the pre-render, and the post-render. So uh, depending on what you want to do with your form, you can enter or hook into the different phases of how Drupal is processing the form. So obviously that form, uh, uh, the form build function when it's called in the process form, uh, you, you can use the after build to hook in, manipulate the data in some way, and then pass it back uh, to the uh, looping function so it can print it out on the page with Drupal get form. Uh, the pre-render and the post-render, pretty much the same thing hooking into the function. Just be careful with these because it is expecting you to return something. Otherwise, you'll get a blank page. So those are other keys worth noting. Uh, okay, so for menus and menu building and working with Forms. When you add your menu pads, a lot of times uh, when you submit a form, you want it to, I don't know, hook into the submission or before you put it out on the page, you want to hook into the pre-render and you're going to add a menu path either for the actual page to have a callback for it so you can register it in Drupal's menus or you're going to have a new callback function for when the, the form succeeds. So, you know, uh, like I had, I had uh, form API demo slash success. Uh, you could add a menu path for that. We saw that in the beginning. The biggest thing is you, you need to remember to clear the cache. This will get a lot of people the first time you go through. Drupal uh, 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 uses tokens to um, uh, replace variables like what node ID you're on or what user you're actually looking for. And the way you, you define that is that when you build your menus. The problem is, is if you don't allow the menu cache to clear, it won't take the new functions that you've put in or the new page callbacks that you've put in. When I first started with Drupal, I think I wasted two days, two full days on just this. Uh, okay, initializing the form. So this was that loop that we ran, that we ran through, and this is a, a little bit out of the scope of what I want to get to because I want to get to the next example, uh, and I feel like this is more sand camp stuff. Uh, right, so initializing the form. Basically what happens is that Drupal looks to see first if you have a post array. So uh, if uh, everybody's used to PHP back in the old days with your server variables and stuff, the global post array would hold all of the data that is submitted from that form. It will also look to see if you have a form build ID and exists. If it has those two things, it thinks, oh, we've already got a form and we're going to move through the process of vetting this form with our validate and submission functions. It's also going to check your token via your, the private key that Drupal set when you installed. So we already talked about that. And then the last piece is, as you saw, there was cache. There were some cache, uh, um, not variables, some cache. What's the word I'm looking for? Not strings. It's when everything's all capital. It's a constant. That's the word I'm looking for. So it's also looking to see if you're anonymous and uh, you saw the cache constants in the Drupal process form function and that is a, a place where it looks to see if it can just display the regular user register form because it's the same for everybody versus uh, an actual node form that is specific for this user with these privileges. Uh, again, we've also talked about the, uh, the private key keeping your site safe and preventing it from injection or XSS, XSS attacks. I won't get into this today, but there is a hook elements. If you have a, a custom module where you need to define your own particular type of element or input type, uh, Drupal does allow you to register that in your module. So you would, of course, do module name underscore elements, and you would define that. Uh, at the last bullet point there, the five-star module, and we already brought up WYSIWYG today, but the WYSIWYG module, they both use their own custom elements for the way that someone clicks on a star 
to, rank, uh, to rate an actual piece of content, or of course for the WYSIWYG to be able to look through the fields and see which field or which uh, element ID you want to stick that tiny MCE WYSIWYG on so it knows to build its JavaScript on just that element. Drupal get form is really the, the workhorse of all of this. Uh, again, in order to get a form to display on the page, you need to just pass it the form ID. So in this case, this would be Drupal get form user register. Uh, and that will render all of the elements that belong to this particular form. It will also look in that module to see if it has a hook form function defined for that form ID. Uh, hook forms, again, this is a, I wrote, it's analogous to hook theme. So for themers, if you want to define your own theme functions, same thing for form developers, you can define your own form functions, and it allows you to do that using this function. We've covered Drupal, Drupal validate form. So again, it validates the token of the form. Uh, you can give it custom uh, validations. And then the last one's really important here. If you want to say that they failed on your validation, you would need to set an error, and that goes into, I believe it's still an array, actually, in Drupal 6, uh, since we're covering that. Uh, form set error is uh, uh, an array that it will loop through at the top of its page building to say, okay, I need to print this out into the messages section so that I can notify the user that they have some problem. So, you know, if they, if they weren't allowed to use numbers in their password, if their name was too long, you would form set error and write your custom message using that function. And uh, I believe I used that function in the first uh, example. And then the last function in, of course, Drupal submit form uh, is uh, a great way to basically process all of the data. If you've written your own custom module and have your own schema, this is where you would actually take that data in and you would use a, uh, an insert command uh, in SQL to actually write it to the database. I believe it's a Drupal write is uh, the, form, uh, the function in Drupal that will allow you to insert records into the database. Dru Drupal write record, sorry. Um, the last two things are really important here about uh, the forms. So you have two scenarios here. You can uh, say that the form passed validation and now I want to take my user to a new great page because they've either purchased something and I want to give them access or I've got something else great to tell them based on what they told me. You would use form state redirect and you would set that as a path. Uh, it does respect uh, uh, path auto, so you can use a, an alias path as well in here. Uh, if you don't want it to do that, and you want it to display the form again, but empty, you need to make sure that you set form state rebuild to true. This one will also be a gotcha, because if you don't set either one of these, it will basically spit the form back out to you, and it will look like nothing happened. And you'll sit there wondering why. This one I didn't waste two days on, but I'm hoping that I can tell you about it now and you won't. So remember those two things about your submissions. Uh, we already covered process form. Uh, yeah, I think I already went through this one, so my, my slide's a little out of order there. Hook form is the, uh, the menu hook that basically builds the form and, and charges the array uh, with all of the things you want to do. Uh, again, I've given some other options here because you can use CCK to do a lot of this on your nodes. Most of this would be for custom form building. I want to stress that. This is for custom form building. Okay, so form scenarios. Long form, multi-step form, and the wizard self-building form. The last one, unfortunately, I didn't have time to get to today to build it. Um, my eyes were uh, wide open when CTools was introduced to me. So uh, Merlin of Chaos, otherwise known as Earl Miles, developed CTools to help with views and panels. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, module, especially if you know what's in it. So uh, I would recommend, if you're doing a lot of form building, to look at the form wizard, as well as the, uh, the modal uh, uh, um, API. It's not modal API. That's a different uh, module. Uh, he has a modal helper. Uh, with a bunch of uh, functions that you can call back to in the page for that, uh, which I will try to show if I can get it together before the end of the lightning talks. So uh, the long form, we basically looked at the, uh, the beginning of that. It's pretty straightforward. Putting out your, your fields on the page, taking the fields in, and doing whatever you want with them, whether it be validating or submitting them. The multi-step form is the one that has always been a little bit of a philosophical debate for people. Um, when Drupal uh, Form API 2.0 came out, it uh, allowed us to store uh, the form state values key 
into an actual storage key, and we could save that and use it as we walk through a couple different pages, or excuse me, a couple different callbacks on a certain form function. Uh, it's easiest to use uh, one form function to continually populate the form, and you can do a switch or a case seeing what step you are in that form process. So again, Ctools' form wizard helps to deal with all of this. It abstracts all of this from your actual form function. Um, I'll leave the sides there. So let's go look at the second example. This would be the multi-step example. So here we are again in hook menu. I've defined just two menus, a regular one and a thanks. And here's my form page function. And I'm going to go ahead and call my form ID here. And you can see that relates to this function down here. I could have also just said fappy multi-step underscore, underscore form to use the proper hook form. I just get out of that sometimes, and I use my own functions. So uh, we don't need to see the DPM on this. But basically, what we do in this is we're going to check to see where we are in the function first, or excuse me, where we are in the interview of our user first. So the first thing I do is I set a step. And I check to see if our form state values is already set. If it's already set, that means we already had a user who submitted something. If it's not set, we can assume that our first step is zero, and we'll set that for the next time we come through this function. So you can see that it says my if statement is if form, if form state values is set, we go ahead and we take the step that's already in our storage key, else we set zero. Next step is to make sure that we take our new step and increment it by one. So the key here is looping through my function, I'm always one step behind what's stored in the array. So right now in my function, I'm on step zero. And in the array, I'm actually stored for step one so that when I come back through, I'll be on step one and I increment to step two in my stored array. So building my, fo my form, we're switching through. I have case zero. So that's where we are. I've got a name. And here was the example I was using, guys, about the tree. I've set that element down here to true. So I have a name field set. So I'm going to wrap everything else that comes under this key's path inside that field set. So you can see here I've done that with the first name text field. I've also set a default value. And I've done that here as well for the last name which is also a step down in that tree. So what's important to realize here, again, is that when this is returned, we're going to have form state values, and that's going to keep this tree structure. So it's not going to be form state values first name, form state values last name. It's actually going to be form state values name first name, form state values name last name. It's really helpful to know that. <laughs> um, Scrolling down, we can see that I'm going to have an interview here. So we'll go look at that. And uh, you see that there are other cases. But let's go ahead and look at case one in the page. And here I am. Let's go ahead and refresh that sucker. OK. Well, I thought I turned my array off, but I haven't. So there are my default values. It says to enter my name. That was my, uh, my callback. But the beginning of this, let's make a sandwich. First name, last name. I hit next, and this is what's helpful here always for me to look at. So you can see this was from the original form submission where everything's stored in the post. Here, I've actually processed the array, and I have a storage step in here. So notice the difference between what was original and what's come out the second time through. I actually have that step set in my storage. The next time through, we'll see that I've gone ahead and stored the first name and last name values. And I'll show you where we've done that here in my function. So down at the bottom of my build function, I go ahead and process the data. So on the first time through, we are on case 0. So this is the second time through. I'm on case 1. And we'll go back up and see what I'm building for the second step. But I'm going to look into my form values. You can see that I'm setting my storage equal to what was in the values. And look there that I kept the tree as true. I passed the actual name key in with it. So step one here was to actually build another field for a sandwich. What kind of sandwich? Coming back over here, we're going to say, we'll say turkey. 
I don't know why I did that. I'm, I'm vegetarian. So now we're safely into our stepping. So you can see now in my storage key, I actually have my step two. My first name and last name are there. Uh, it will come after we, uh, that would be in my values because that, that came through for the last one. So you can see sandwich is turkey. So remember, I'm always one ste step back in what I'm st storing versus what I'm processing. So, so right there you can see that I'm in form state, which would be, guys, uh, the top of this array here is form state. And then I'm down here in values. The question was, where's turkey? It's right there because we haven't actually saved it into our storage yet. We're processing that on the next loop. And then, of course, the last one here, I'm going to pick a condiment, and that would be my last step, and I can click complete order. So looking down here, I have a validate function. I didn't really use it to validate anything. I just used it to print the next message. It's not usually common to do that. but uh, And here's the gold right here. So this is basically my submission function. So every single time a user clicks to the next step, I'm always running Drupal get form, build the form, validate the form, submit the form, then what happens? So you can see here, this is that last step, submit the form. I'm calling in my step again based on what I have set in my values. Uh, if my values are set, that means someone submitted already. I can pull my step out of the storage. And then I check to see where I am. If I'm anywhere before the last step, return. Not only am I returning, I'm returning with rebuild false, meaning it's saving all of the storage stuff still ready to be used in the next step for me. You'll see down here where you can do one of two things. You can either do rebuild true or you can unset the form state and it will actually clear out the storage so you can push the user through and you've taken their information at that point. So again, right back up above. Uh, nope, you don't need to see that. Uh, we can just complete our order now. And there's my last thing. We will be serving Stephen Ader a turkey sandwich with, uh, and it looks like I didn't actually pull my value for my condiment there. Oh, well. End of, uh, of multi-step demo. Great success. All right. So my last few uh, things here. Again, we've been talking about some form altering and menu altering. Form altering is great because you don't actually have to write all sorts of form functions. You can use uh, another module's existing functions and build on that. Be very careful about how you set the array keys for that type of stuff. And uh, where did I put that? I think I have the example for that right here. So look at my uh, usage here. This is, uh, I'm actually using a different form of this function. I'm actually using, it's, it's hook form alter. But there's also another function that is hook form form ID alter. So that means in my actual hook form alter, I don't have to say if it's this form ID, then do all of this stuff. Because a lot of functions get clouded up with that. So you always have to check every single form. Well, it's nice to have an actual uh, form alter for that specific form. So I've gone ahead and hooked into the, uh, the user register form. And I've defined a couple things on that form. So you can see with the actual build of these, if I went to the user module, I would see an actual form array that builds these keys. I'm overwriting the form array and setting my own values into those keys. So if I go into a anonymous state in my browser, I'm not logged in here, I can look at that user creation, it looks like I've hacked into that. It no longer says username and password. It says my name, and I dare you to enter an email address. I've also uh, hooked into the submission button, so you have all sorts of things that you can do there, and you know, hopefully it won't start smoking on you. That's also a great way to hook into the actual elements of uh, uh, a pre-existing form. Same thing with hook menu alter. I can't tell you how many times I want to rewrite an actual module function because I like what it does almost, and I need to do two other things. So hook menu alter is a great way to do that because you can basically rewrite that function off of the original menu. So if I built a menu uh, page callback that said render my page, so when I go to that actual uh, you know, slash demo and the page callback was render my page, I could actually rewrite render my page 
using the hook menu alter. With that, I could just say, all right, the menu callback is my custom rewrite menu my page. So it's going to look for that function instead. You've got to be careful when you do something like that, though. There's two things you've got to make sure you don't do. One, you don't want to uh, call a function that already exists by rewriting your own function with the exact same name. White screen of death will ensue. Uh, the other thing you also want to make sure is that any other uh, uh, dependencies or other callback functions within the original function you still have access to. So you, you may need to do a module load. Uh, uh, I think it's module load function or module load page where you can actually pull in uh, uh, dependent functions from like node.pages.inc or node.admin.inc. If you want some other functions from another module, you can actually grab those functions that way. Yeah, module load include. That was the function I was looking for. Okay, so we're almost done. <clears throat> Caveats and gotchas. We already said most of them. Make sure you clear the damn menu cache. Yeah, I said it. Clear that cache. Uh, the form is an array, not an object. Coming from the Ruby on Rails community, that was difficult for me initially. I thought everything was an object, but it's not. It's an array. Uh, forms are definitely cached, so there is an actual element in the, uh, the basic form structure where you can define what kind of cache that form gets. Uh, you can cache per page, cache per user, and cache per role, uh, as well as a global cache that you can include it in. Uh, this is just a basic HTML thing, but if you are defining a uh, file upload, uh, you'll need to set the form type to, in, uh, to include the encryption type multipart. And then the last piece of this is if you are going to use the aha functions, and I didn't go into this because I wanted to do the C tool stuff, which is a lot cooler. Um, if you do use any AJAX, the aha key elements where you're calling some uh, uh, remote functions or some remote scripting on, on your form, Make sure to use the best practice of using Drupal behaviors versus actually writing your own jQuery to load on the document, the DOM load uh, event. Drupal behaviors will actually bind your event to all of the other events that are happening on your page, whether you know they're happening or not, and will continuously check so that your functions don't overwrite another module's functions. And also, if another module were to enact one of their remote functions, it won't overwrite yours. So uh, best practice when you're loading your JavaScript is always to uh, build with Drupal behaviors. Form destination. Right. Uh, you can set where your form goes after this. I'm just going to skip that because I really don't care. Uh, so the future. Um, yeah, so there's not a lot of changes to the form API in Drupal 7. Uh, the real major changes are in how actual uh, things are uh, handled as entities. Uh, and I'm not the best person to go into this, so hopefully somebody will be doing a Drupal 7 overview for uh, Drupal LA. Um, and whoever went to uh, the actual uh, WebChick tour over the weekend, I'm sure they had one heck of a, uh, an intro to that. But uh, Earl Miles did an advanced Ajax presentation at Bad Camp. Uh, I do have that listed in my slides uh, that you can see. You can also go look at the AJAX commands that are listed on api.drupal.org. We've, of course, mentioned C tools. And uh, at this point, we can open it up for a discussion of any uh, questions. But here are my sources. Um, that top book right there, guys, uh, Pro Drupal Development by John K. Van Dyke, uh, that was probably one of the best books I read uh, for Drupal 6. Uh, I see a lot of head shaking going on out there. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how intense people like their examples, but I like my stuff code heavy. I basically want to see the stuff. I don't want to just talk about it. So I really recommend that book. Uh, Todd Tomlinson just came out with the D7 version. It is available on Amazon. Um, and there are all of the other. <laughs> it is in John Remind's hands. Um, <laughs> that's the only one that exists. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. Uh, but uh, yeah, I also don't, uh, I don't not carry mine around with me at all times either. So I do like every once in a while to refresh with mine. So uh, Drupal 7, Drupal 6. You don't not carry yours Yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't, and I don't speak in double negatives either. Um, so uh, there are some of the other uh, sources that I use to help me in this presentation. So uh, I'll open it up for questions, but that is my presentation. about the form API? Did you guys like what you saw? Oh, yeah. Question? Not a question. Just a comment. A comment.